So, good day, everybody, and welcome to today's open seminar with Vlad Marinescu, President of the International Esports Federation. Today's seminar is part of the AISTS Sports Management Master's Program. The program was co-founded by the International Olympic Committee and named the world's number one program for the past four years. So, yay. Since COVID-19, we have been running our 2020 sessions online, giving us the unique opportunity to open selected programs such as this to the global sports industry. This is the third session so far, and we will have two more after this. If you are interested in the AISDS Master's Program, you can find out more on our webpage, AISDS.org, where you can also apply for the next edition starting this September. AISDS works with many international federations and sports organizations for research and consultancy. And if this is an area that you would like to discuss more, we would be happy to hear from you. And this is an area that we have collaborated with the International Esports Federation in the last two years, which has also helped us to gain a deeper insight into their organization. So um, a quick um, housekeeping for today would be presentation from Mr. Please, uh, you could post your questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat. And we will then use the last 20 minutes for the Q&A. If we do not answer all questions today, we will respond via email. So a short and a brief introduction uh, on our current speaker. Mr. Nar why is Vlad the perfect speaker for today's presentation? Well, firstly, other than the fact that he is the president of the International Esports Federation, he is seven times American champ in karate and practices many other sports at a high level. He has had an amazing passion for sports and in 2003, he worked for the European Judo Union. Vlad then became the director general of Sport Accord, which all of you are aware of. And in 2019, that was in 2013. This is the umbrella organization for over 100 international federations. Esports has always been his passion since the middle school years. And in 2019, Vlad took the role of president of the United States Sports Esports Federation. His main objective was to unite the esports ecosystem and creating a sustainable model for the benefit of esport development. Now, as president of the IESF, Vlad's primary target, I would say, is supporting member national federations, while also promoting unity and recognition, as well as collaborating with stakeholders and partners for, the un for unified objectives, protecting athletes and developing esports for the better of tomorrow. With no further ado, I now introduce you to Vlad Marinescu. Thank you, Vlad, for joining us today, and I wish you all a good presentation. Thank you very much for that lovely intro. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm getting red a little bit from such a lovely intro. Thank you. Uh, I'd first like to begin by saying that it's really a pleasure for me to have this time. I very much respect, admire, and appreciate AISTS all the staff and, and everyone working there for educating and preparing the sport professionals for tomorrow, who, of course, you can gauge the development of sport in general accordingly to the professionalism of the masters that are coming on the market. So it's a pleasure to uh, make this presentation. Let me start by sharing my screen. And we can get going. Uh, as an introduction, uh, thank you very much for that. I am the president of the International Esports Federation. It's very fresh as of yet. And as uh, previously mentioned, uh, I had my first touch with esports when I was in the middle school doing LAN parties. Uh, the benefit of that was that when I was growing up, later I found out that I could not sleep for a whole weekend and be efficient at uh, working, which applied to my business life quite well, especially organizing sporting events. As many of you know who have organized various sporting events, uh, it's very quickly that you realize sleep is something that you need to learn how to deal without and efficiently. And I think that that gave me a, a good understanding of how to efficiently work without sleep. Without sleep. So the uh, agenda for today, we have 40 minutes to go through a couple of different things. 
uh, I was thinking that it'd be interesting to go through with the class of actually what are games, what are esports, and what is sport. To start directly by is esports a sport and can it be considered as such. Uh, following that, to go through the environment and who are the stakeholders, who are the people that are playing in the market, what are some numbers and some figures uh, regarding esports as an activity and as a business. And finally, because we are in the situation where we are today speaking about how the COVID-19 virus has affected the entire esports community and the entire sports community's intention and willingness and interest regarding doing some form of esports activity. Before we open up for Q&A. So 1940s, we had the first computerized game. Pong came around in 72. I'm going to go quickly through these because I'm guessing the majority of you know some of the history. Some will be interesting fun points and some uh, are just going to understand quickly how games developed. In 1977, we have the first uh, computerized system for video games, Atari, which uh, featured joysticks and cartridges and allowed for and allowed for people to change the games that they would be playing at home, purely for, for entertainment purposes. The first sport game came to be in 1988. That was football, Madden, who uh, made that game. And we had our first victory for the computers beating Gary Kasparov uh, in a match of chess in 1997. Of course, artificial intelligence today where it is, I don't think there is a game left where a computer cannot defeat a human being as we've developed. But in summary, the interesting thing to say is that you have games of all types of genres today existing in super high quality from console games played on either PlayStation or Xbox or other consoles to computers, PC games, to mobile games that are downloaded now in the past Corona time exorbitantly uh, superior in graphics and in fun than anything before. Plus you have virtual reality and you have simulators. So if we have to define the sports and what is an actual sport and what is a video game, I like to make a, a bar. So you talk about having uh, the digitization of a sport on the full left side of the curve and on the full right side of the curve, you have a, an activity on a computer that does not require any type of physical dexterity. Uh, it requires a lot of mental ability, of course, because it would be a pure mind game like chess on a computer, but it does not involve sweating or the full digitization of sport. And you have everything in between. So if we start, talk about sport digitization, we're speaking about cycling, where you're cycling like Swift or rowing. Uh, simulator, if you believe it or not, today they're using simulators to give minors driver's licenses. That's how realistic simulators have become. Virtual reality means that you're moving to affect the result in the game, and it may be close to that actual sport itself. So if you play, let's say, tennis in VR or football in VR or boxing in VR, you're replicating the movement that is done in that sport, not on the same level, not with the same um, enthusiasm or, or with the same power requirement, but you are kind of doing that sport. When we go to fewer sport games, then we change the input to being a combination of buttons or sequences on a remote control that are not like that particular game or that particular sport. But of course, you get to learn the rules of the sport. You get to learn how the sport is played. Then you have all the other genres of sports, which uh, are, are very many. But what I'd like to mention specifically is that sport, um, as, per, as per interest and for uh, game time is a lot less viewed than the other genres of sport, whether it be action or shooter or role playing or adventure. And FIFA is uh, the most played sport game today, and it is in the top 22 most watched uh, online games as well. So gamers have set the video gaming industry to record levels. Netflix says Fortnite is a bigger threat than HBO. Red Dead Redemption 2, it made $725 million in its opening weekend. Now, the gaming industry has grown faster than anyone could have ever imagined. It is now a $139 billion a year business. In terms of revenue, that's bigger than worldwide box office, music streaming and album sales, the NFL, the NBA, MLB, and the NHL combined. Yeah, every sports league right now is terrified. The reason I wanted to show you that video is to understand the size of the gaming community. And although it sounds a little bit funny, but the 
actual market and audience of games is bigger than all sports combined, movies, music, and all other entertainment. Uh, the big question is who is playing? Uh, who are actually playing these games that we are speaking about? And the answer is everybody. So we're not speaking just about a young demographic and we're not speaking about just men. It's uh, very close to gender equality. You have 46% of women that are playing online games today and 54 that are men. And of course, according to the gender, according to the interest, according to the age group, the demographic, there is a plug and play option for everyone and everyone can find something that interests them and makes them uh, happy to play. So the big question is, is eSport a sport? And this is something that, that is um, today at the heart of the discussion between official sport bodies like ministries of sport in various countries, uh, Olympic committee, the uh, GAFE and all other stakeholders. And I, I like to think about what is actually a sport because my background is coming from sport and I am who I am today because I do sport. Physical sport is the only sport I knew growing up. And the components of physical sport versus the components of um, digital sport or, or esports, what, what is a sport? So for me, it's simple. You need to have a competition with somebody. That's what a sport is. Whether you're competing with yourself or whether you're competing with an adversary, there has to be a competition. And this can be between any type of activity. A competition that is regulated, meaning that we know clearly when we do that sport together, what it takes to win and who can win in what way. Of course, knowing how to win is one thing, you need to have skill involved, whether that be skill, which is a physical skill, a dexterous skill, a mental skill, or any other type of skill. And you can play it against somebody. So if these are the competition is existing, in my opinion, that would be a sport. Now, do we speak about entertainment or do we speak about, are there physical benefits to the person who's playing? So this is something that is, I think the most controversial area about, is eSport a sport? And the answer to that is, well, is it really healthy and beneficial from a physical point of view to the people that are playing? So I honestly believe in, and I've been asked this question, why, why are you involved in eSports when you're such a fit guy and, and you like sport so much and you've worked in sport your whole life? And the answer for me is that I truly believe, and I'll get into it later of how, that humans need to have a very good combination of a lot of different things to evolve properly. We need to have physical movement, of course. We need to have entertainment as well. And I truly believe that esports and gaming is going to continue to happen and is thriving now. However, the way that we apply the, the, the responsibilities and the requirements of the people who are playing by including some requirement for physical movement or for education in the social aspect or in the nutrition aspect, I think we're able to find a model where the ecosystem can be complete and we can allow the youth to have fun, but also be responsible and be healthy. And I'll get into a couple of the ideas and examples of how, how that can work. So the, the mind aspect, it's been proven that when you're gaming or you're playing games, every game is different. So if you're talking about, as we talked before, the pure digitization of a sport, clearly you have those physical aspects. If you're speaking about a non-physical dexterous mind sport, uh, there are some mental benefits, of course, to playing those sports uh, and socializing with that community. So if we think about sport and we think about, you know, this was just a fun fact of what was the first sport and the sport require you to sweat. And we look at all the sports, every sport is different. And I truly believe that there is a space and a segment for every person to find what they want to have and, and what they want to do that makes them happy. And if we are successful at discussing of how we can unite the people in a positive way to motivate and reinforce the lacking parts in that activity, we're able to do it in a good way. So how was the evolution to esports? And this was a question I think, you know, is this interesting for the people? Is this going to replace sport? I'd like to show you a small video of, um, of the uh, big esports tournament. We just met here, you know, see it just brings people together, it's amazing. It's absolutely mind-blowing. 
where eSports has come. These are those moments that I don't think anybody on that stage is going to forget. I love the emotion, you know, this is what it's all about. This is it. They've done what usually you would imagine is impossible. So ESL is the biggest company that organizes big sporting events for esports around the planet today, and they do it in a very positive way. I think anyone who's been to a sporting event can understand that it's entertainment. There is a fan base. People are there. There is a business model. It has all the components of a major sporting event and an entertainment system to further promote esports. So we have, we have the timeline of the evolution of, of different games that came through uh, to the level where it is today, where it's a big business today. And the, the, summary, the summary that I can give is that esports is a, is a marketing mechanism in order to increase product life cycle of various games. So the community that's playing the games are interesting, but the starting aspect of why are esports financed and supported so well and why are they followed so much is because people are playing those various games that are owned by publishers. In a second, we'll talk about the different the different stakeholders. But when you have an activity at the highest level of people competing in an activity that's practiced by hundreds of millions of people around the world, the eyeballs and the minds and the hearts of those fans are going to be associated to watch that stream or watch that event or watch that competition. And as we know in sport business, eyeballs on events means revenue, means market value, means media value. Some of the biggest companies around the world are associated today with esports and in the current COVID crisis, different budgets have been allocated to esports online event, whether it be online for traditional sports in a different variation or whether it be esports events that have been created to raise awareness and raise money. So it allows a direct, a direct uh, link to that market. And the market that we're speaking about are youth. We're speaking about 500 million audience uh, this year, which we have to see if it'll go above or beyond or, or underneath according to the COVID. This is a good question for everyone. Do we think that because of the COVID-19 crisis at the moment, there will be more audience that is watching esports online? Well, if more people are playing and more people are home and the internet usage is huge, then of course we can expect that that number will increase that you will have a higher total audience due to the COVID-19 crisis. So when we speak about revenues, however, this is interesting because the revenues, like with all of the other traditional sports, uh, are expected to decrease. Although viewership is increasing, revenues are decreasing. And how is that possible? Uh, not by a lot, of course. The reason why they're decreasing is because you cannot have those big live events. You cannot have uh, the best of the best competing with each other physically and to create from that physical uh, competition, all of the different mediatic products that you are. So we are expecting to have increase in viewership because of the COVID-19 crisis. However, there will be a decrease in global revenues of esports. Uh, and this is an important point just to mention that gaming and esports, we spoke what gaming is and we spoke what esports are. Although esports uh, will decline in revenue because of the COVID crisis, the gaming revenue will increase and it has increased. And we'll get into those numbers in, in a minute. In a minute. So in, in summary, elite esports of this first section, elite esports is an activity that generates revenue and generates promotion for games. And this is important because it's not the sole aspect or sole target of an international federation, whether it be traditional sport or whether it be esports. But with different companies owning the rights for different games, the publishers, they have the ability to promote those games with elite sports, with elite esports. And that is being done today very successfully, and it will continue to work online and offline as soon as we can start to have events. So what are, what are the, the benefits of esports and the, the challenges of the whole community? 
So I, I, don't, I would not like to read the screen one by one, but just to mention the most important ones. The interesting thing about gaming that we have to understand is that it's here and it's not going away. People are playing. And anybody, regardless of any demographic or any physical attribute with which they are born, size or height or gender, has the ability to play esports and has the ability to learn how to play various games in esports and perform at the highest level. It's been proven that playing esports, certain ones, of course, every sport is different, but the majority of them are boosting brain activity and multitasking ability as well as concentration. You can imagine when you're playing a game competitively on a computer that's very advanced, you have to memorize so many different things depending on the game again, regarding whether it be characters or whether it be um, what buttons to push or whether it be the information about the game itself, like the target, the scope. At the same time, it's allowing for, I believe in this time, the mental health of the players who are home to be able to have a way to socialize. And it's interesting to note that we speak about a community, the general ideology or the general perception about esports is that kids are not social because they're wearing a headset somewhere in a dark room. Uh, at the same time, while I agree that that's not what kids should do solely, you would be surprised at the level of socialization, of digital socialization that is occurring and how many friends those kids actually have online that they're playing the game with, how many friends that they have that they're chatting with and that they're in game with and that after that friendship extends to beyond the game. <clears throat> so definitely esports and gaming is a, a modernization of the whole socializing dynamic <clears throat> challenges. Well, clearly esports, the ecosystem and the environment needs to be finalized. And that's something that with the International Federation, we are doing at the moment to find out how we unite all the stakeholders in a way where everybody understands what is their objective, what is their task, what are their benefits, and they work together to promote a, a healthy way of doing esports, a responsible gaming, which for me is what esports is. Uh, it's been proven, of course, that gaming is addictive. So the World Health Organization has uh, listed gaming as a disorder. But at the same time, uh, there are benefits to counteracting and potential educational aspects that we can give to counteract the, the challenging aspect of addictiveness. Specifically, it's addictive because of the closed circle reward system that you're receiving. Every time you play a game, you receive a badge or a notification. It gives a quick and fast response of happiness and of attribution to an activity that you're doing. How do we make sure that esports is growing sustainably? And how do we make sure that it's not a purely for money business, that people aren't doping, they're not match fixing, that the children playing, the athletes playing, regardless of the age, are able to do that responsibly and in a way that allows them to receive happiness from the actual game and benefit from it while not neglecting and forgetting the other items that are important. So let's go through who are actually the stakeholders and some examples of, of what they're doing and what their responsibilities are at the moment and how, how they interact with each other and how the whole actual model, the business model of esports is going. So you have, you have the publishers that are making the games and these are for-profit companies that are investing to create an activity which they are selling and promoting, whether it be selling for a game or with micro purchases in the game in order to create a community and to create a following around that game to further promote it. Whether that include also having tournaments around it and doing esports activity around it or just pure marketing. You have the, the suppliers that are making the actual devices from the consoles to the VR sets to the computers or phones that we're using uh, and all of the hardware in between there, um, as well as the companies that are helping and allowing for the, the players to stream what they're doing so that they can attract followership to themselves. We have the event organizers, the publishers, which are uh, very closely can be compared to promoters in some of the professional sports as well. They are the ones who are 
really heavily promoting and creating top level events that allow to show the best of esports to the mass and to the community. Then you have, of course, the leagues, various leagues that are being played around the world at all levels, whether it be a regional level, whether it be a national level, content level, or an international level, and teams that are competing in these events. So if we follow it, if we follow the flow of how the actual business transaction works, we have teams that are competing in games. And those games are organized in different leagues and tournaments and matchups by different promoters, by publishers, or by organizations such as the International Esport Federation as well, who does the World Championship. That activity that's taking place on site becomes global because we are streaming it. And it's interesting to see, as a side note, that today I am seeing esports on Eurosport and some other top broadcasters. But esports doesn't benefit or doesn't utilize a traditional linear broadcasting model like all other sports have or benefit from. So this is also a plus and a minus because at the same time, think about when I'm, when I'm streaming a tournament online. Well, I know exactly how many people are there, what's their age demographic, who they are, and mixed with all kinds of different engines, how we can commercialize that. So we have a direct link and a direct touch to the fans. And having that direct link to the fans and having huge viewership around the world for the different esports events that are taking place, the result is that lots of brands and advertisers are very interested to get involved and to get directly access to the demographic that they're looking for for their products. So it allows for a very targeted and specific segmentation and approach in the marketing model around the activity. While at the same time, it's promoting further play and it's promoting the games that are happening. A little bit about the International Esports Federation. So the International Esports Federation, of which I am the president of recently, was founded in 2008. It's the oldest and biggest and most recognized international federation of esports comprising of 72 national member federations today, out of which 35 are recognized by their ministries of sport, their highest sporting authority, or their NOC. The organization has done a lot of world championships and general assemblies and is currently involved in various activities for uniting the entire stakeholder community. And we are working in the last period as, as a target. It's understood that we need to have unity inside the esports ecosystem. So for that reason, we have a unification now with the Asian Esports Federation, the Asian Electronic Sports Federation. This is the organization that is responsible for organizing the Asian Games for esports, the first meddling event um, at that level. And we've also signed a direct collaboration with WESCO whereby the ISF is the International Federation of Esports. Unity is vitally important in order to have a joint message and a clear message. And I just, I don't wanna spend a lot of time talking about the ISF, just to mention that the activities that the ISF is doing are a little bit different than a traditional international federation. So I, I, I had the pleasure of uh, being at Sport Accord from 2013 to 2015, in which time I had an opportunity to work with very nice, talented people from various international federations. And I've made myself, uh, my, my, my heart is in judo. I've been in judo from 2003 until today and probably for the rest of my life because um, judo gave me the direction and the ability to learn everything that, that I've learned around sport. So I, I know how an international federation should work and what are the objectives. The main core difference between esports and traditional sport at an international federation level is that esports as a target does not need to get more players. It's not the objective of the ISF to get more players. The objective is how to unite the community to give the players a benefit, how to give them educational projects that allow them to develop the other areas of their life as well that are lacking and to game responsibly. The objective of any international federation of traditional sport is how to get more players, 
how to attract people to do that sport. And I believe that together we're able to do projects and programs that in cooperation with all stakeholders, including from the traditional sport to the, to the e-sport, we're able to launch programs that can move kids back to sport and make them actually physically move. And as long as we have the similar ideology of wanting to do something good, I think that we can reach collaborations and unities with all the, all the world's stakeholders who have an interest or have a foundation or have uh, an understanding of esports. But it's important to, to mention that we're not talking about just esports, the elite ones. So when we speak about swimming, we're not speaking about swimming as only Michael Phelps, who is the most decorated Olympic level in one games uh, swimming athlete. We're speaking about everybody. And this unity that I'm speaking about before is important and vital in order to address that market and that demographic in a correct way, working together with the publishers and with everybody to make sure that we unite that community. So esports means responsible gaming. Uh, just some ideas about the collaboration. Finally, all those stakeholders that I'm mentioning about and talking about, it's important that we find a solution and a model where we can collaborate with everybody involved in sport around the world, primarily to create an educational system and a model to get kids back to moving again, to educate them psychologically, physically, socially. And we've just founded our education commission with various universities around the world to start this analysis and to produce content and material that can motivate uh, the gamers to have a healthy lifestyle. And that's both a physically healthy lifestyle, social one and a mental one. So some ideas about how we make this happen. How, how can we have a unity and, and get kids to move again? So today, today we, we understand and we can see that when we look at children in restaurants, think about the last time that you went to a restaurant. Unfortunately, it's been months ago because we are all locked down because during the coronavirus. But in restaurants, and I'm sure at home, those who have kids, uh, they understand that devices, games, iPads, iPhones, computers, children view them as a reward mechanism, a reward mechanism for doing something, for doing an activity, whether that be just being quiet around the house when the parents are uh, on Zoom calls and conferences uh, that they are getting to play a game. It's heavily embedded in their psychology from a young age. The youth understands that games are rewards. At the same time, not just the carrot, but games can be the stick. I've never seen a child uh, feel such pain as when losing a uh, phone ability for a week or for a month. So I think nobody can refute the fact that, that devices and games are both the carrot and the stick to children. And if implemented and used in the right way, we're able to effectuate a good change in them. So we have a couple of different projects and the applications of course can vary one by one, but we're starting from the ISF level to work with governments and with schools and with different partners in order to do a program where we have trucks, esports trucks going from school to school, stopping at the school, uh, which is known before time. The kids who want to play have to run a kilometer Whoever runs fastest plays first. Think about that just for a second and, and what that would do to the youth at a school who wants to play. So they want to play, they want to play first, they would run. And we're going to see now when the model launches in the next short period, how the effectiveness is with the general health of the people. Uh, gym to play is the similar idea. We have our board member from Macedonia who, uh, who has this inactive at the moment working half of the building is a traditional gym with facilities for treadmill and for rowing and for other types of physical activities like a regular gym and the kids can charge their card with 30 minutes of treadmill in order to play next door in the esports center for 15 minutes of course the numbers can change according to demand and to uh, the number of people that are there but i can tell you that from such projects, the line for kids who want to play is around the corner and kids are willing and ready to make those physical movements. And with this in mind, as a, as a primary start of negotiation and of discussion and collaboration, I'm sure that we can effectuate a positive change in, in the youth while letting them have fun. The second part of how we can collaborate is of course, to add gamification into the traditional sports to make sports fun. 
And to, to have the kids that are involved in today's society who are used to high technological level of games, who are used to being bombarded with TV shows and movies that, that are showing all kinds of really cool 3D graphics that are giving them badges and rewards that are giving them the participation medal for just taking a step. How do we use these type of, of experiences in, in helping the sport federations around the world to reach out to that young community and to have them come out and try the sport? So we know that having, let's say, a sport game, which is not the benefit of every single federation, let's take FIFA, for example, which is the superlative. You have all of the youth around the world who know the names of all the teams, who know the names of all the players, who know exactly what the statistics are behind all the players who are playing. And I guarantee you that those children that know all that information, a part of them would love to go out and play the actual sport itself. And the majority of them will become the fans of the professional uh, league of the champions league of the football matches, at least as a spectator. So what is, what is the target and why are we doing all this? And I think I've summarized it enough to talk about the reason we're doing this. And the reason that we exist is to unite everybody who is, has a voice, who's a stakeholder in order to do programs that ensures that we have a better future. So what, what is with this uh, situation and the virus of the COVID-19 and how is it affecting exactly the market? So regarding sales of games, regarding the usage of games, it's unbelievably surprising how much more and how much increase there has been throughout the world for gaming, for streaming, and for viewing streams than in the past period. So this is just a, from the games industry, uh, just a small article that January to March, there has been, been an increase of 35% uh, to the market. If we look at all of the Twitch hours watched for the last years from 2018, you can see that huge spike from 2019 to January. So that means that people are home and they're ready to engage. And yes, they have more time now They've been aware of the gaming industry. They have more time. They're watching, they're watching the, um, the games and they're watching the streamers stream what's happening. And as a result of that, just to prove that, that that point, the next one we talk about streamed, we have an increase in that as well. The uniqueness of esports and gaming is that people can play a game. They can stream the way they play a game and add their personality on top of it and make revenue from people following and watching that. I think if somebody would have told me 10 years ago that uh, children prefer watching videos of other people playing, I, I would never agree. And I think I, I, I would never believe it would be true. But according to different sources, it's incredible to know that actually children are viewing other people playing. And of course, that generates the entire business model of sport. If we take two big companies in the world who are doing games, the profitability uh, around their sales due to this COVID-19 is incredible. They have increased in their first quarter their, their projections for the year by un, un, unreasonable and un, unexplainable numbers other than that servers are crashing around the world. And we have hit, for example, for Stream, which is making a game called CSGO, um, they hit 20 million concurrent users recently, which is an all time record. So you have today because of the COVID crisis and th that's a report that actually their servers crashed. You have today more sales than ever in games. You have today more people playing than ever in games while more people are streaming than ever and more people are watching. So the result of the, of the COVID crisis is that you have an increase in the gaming activity on all fronts regarding the commercial part. That being said, the esports are facing a similar, um, a similar and the same problem with events being canceled due to the crisis. So the reason why, you know, you can't come together, you can't have sports in a venue with people because of legislation around the world the result of that is that 
different events are being canceled. Like the world championship that we were organizing this year has been pushed to next year, but we're able to amend the model quickly and to do esports uh, online tournaments in order to counteract that. So if you look at the finalizing about trends around the world, these are all coming from esports observer. Um, everybody is losing money who's organizing events and every event is being canceled. It's only in online game revenues that are increasing. So Tencent uh, reported a 31% increase in online games revenue. It makes sense. When you have in-person events, you can't have them anymore. All that revenue is lost. However, all those people still want to follow and still want to watch what's happening around their games. So in the past, there are sports that we know have been existing in a type of digital version like rowing or biking or sims from formula one or from other racing games um, these traditional international traditional sports were the easiest to convert to do stay at home tournaments and these stay at home tournaments is what everybody has been concentrating on uh, we've had from our national federation in saudi arabia a fundraiser that involved uh, more than 70 countries and over 100,000 players that were competing at the same time so while people are home Esports has been organizing events. And the difference is you can see between the two pictures, Coca-Cola series for NASCAR, everyone is at home participating and playing uh, that, that game. Now with traditional international sport federations, how has the COVID crisis affected them and how are they reacting to it? Uh, very much uncertainty and activities are frozen because as all of you know, from the business model of sport, international federations, national federations and all other sport organizations are making revenue from marketing activity, sponsorship or TV or other marketing activity around events. With people not being able to come together and events not being able to happen, those incomes are frozen, those events can't take place and they're suspended, which means also that their contact with their community is suspended. So every international federation has been working to ideology, to think about how they can run some type of e-version of their events. There are some sports that are sports where they have sports simulation or close to or have games. There are other sports that do not. But federations, I think, have been, have been quick to amend and adapt to that. And I can tell you with the ISF level, we've been working with different international federations to give them solutions technologically and from idea point of view in order to uh, do something online. So you have, for example, for, for different types of events, Trainings, conferences, we're on, now, we're on one right now rather than doing it in, in person, which is 10 times harder than doing it in person because I can't see who's seeing me. And if you're bored out of your mind, if you're sleeping or if you're, if you're actually enjoying this, this quick discussion. But online, this is an example for, for cycling, for Swift. They're hosting online events because they're fortunate enough to have a sport that can be digitized completely so people can compete and can stream what they're doing and have following to that. You have Muay Thai which is launching their form of, uh, of uh, kata, would it be, where they can do this form with coaches and referees online. They have a platform ready to go. They do the scoring. They get together, they do the scheduling and so on. And with sports like judo, where you cannot do judo online through Zoom to follow up, they're doing IGF Fit. IGF Fit is where they do different exercises and the people have a profile and badges and can compete against each other in a community. All in all, what's, what's important to say, and I've reached my 40 minute mark, uh, is, is that with the COVID-19 crisis, the, the gaming industry is booming and the international federations are understanding the requirement to do something virtually while their communities are stuck at home. And it's vitally important to do something at this moment because being stuck at home is affecting the mental health and the physical health of everybody. So having the ability to get on a PlayStation and to play a video game with your friends online during the crisis, I'm sure has been very beneficial to the sanity of the global population. While at the same time, opening up the eyes and the understanding from other international federations in traditional sports to the fact that we can do something virtual, we can do something digital, and we can do something from a distance. So to finalize, uh, this is an interesting question for all of you. What do you think will happen when we go back to 
being able to socialize and meet with our friends at a dinner table or at a restaurant or at a bar or anywhere out in public, do you think we're still going to be engaged on our phones? And has the coronavirus taught us to appreciate and to enjoy the time of physically socializing with each other? Or have we understood that it's easy to work from home and it's easy to not have to actually meet anybody and just to be in technology all day? Time will tell. Thank you very much for the time. And I think we're going to Q&A. Yeah. Well, thank you for the great presentation, Vlad. I must say it's been really informative. I've heard it. Uh, I've heard you speak previously in Miami and I can never get tired of your presentations. Um, I also have to say that, you know, they often say women are very good at multitasking. It was absolutely difficult to follow you as well as pick out the questions which you are answering while speaking. So I hope I've captured some of the questions that have not been um, answered in your presentation. And the first one I'm going to go with, go with is actually, um, it's a double question. And I know that one links to the, to the other. And um, here we go. So it is, it is, it is, is it in the agenda of the Fed Federation to make esports a part of the Olympic Games? If yes, what challenges do you think you will have to overcome? And I do know that the second part will relate to your answer, which is a second question. So I'm going to put them both together. And the, the second question is, the games are developed by private companies. If these companies no longer exist, their games will also no longer exist. How can the Federation mitigate these risks for players who will no longer have their favorite games? So. Thank you very much for the first question. So I'll go quickly. Um, I very much appreciate and respect everything the IOC is doing around sports and how they've helped to sustain and develop sports at the highest level to the Olympic Games. And this is an interesting topic because I, I am familiar with the movement being in judo for so many years and working closely with the IOC on various projects to hear the question that should esports be a discipline in the games? Uh, part of me says that uh, absolutely the esports is able to be an event at the games. And the other part of me thinks that it would need its own forum, maybe in association with the IOC to develop a pure electronic games. So I'm, I'm left and right about it. And there are benefits and positives of, but the only person who can decide that is the International Olympic Committee. And I think that, I think that they just um, at the moment have the dialogue and the discussion to understand also from their side, the benefits, positives and negatives about esports. But I think that the question here isn't yet, should esports be in the games? That was made clear by the President Bach during an IOC session. The question is, how do we work together between the traditional sport federations and esports to really make sure that the grassroots kids that are playing do have a benefit, do have a dream, and, and can realize it? And for the, the games, uh, yes, the games are changing. Uh, luckily, because the, the world is developing, there's always the next game that's coming out that's in more high definition, that has more abilities and more options and more tools and more, 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 more. And I think that the movement over for a professional esports athlete from one type of game in a genre to another type of game in a genre, depending on the genre, should not be that difficult. So let's take a little example, like if we're doing Formula One and Formula One doesn't come out with the new Formula One game, but they come out with a street racer formula game. I'm sure that the professional drivers in the sim that are playing will be able to adapt and will be able to progress. So I don't have a big fear of that. That being said, of course, there are some very hard strategy games that when the game changes and the game goes to a different game, of course, all that knowledge and all those characters knowing the powers and the strengths and the weaknesses is very difficult to evolve. But I'm sure that the people who are involved in the community of traditional sport feel that same difficulty as time wears on and as their body gets a little bit used and they have to find a way to evolve and adapt. Thank you for that. So um, this is a, a question I think uh, for, it's, it's really important to me and I'm going to get take my chance to pose it through to you. Um, while I was at the International uh, Esport Conference in um, Korea last year, I spoke to some of the girl gamer organizations. And as, a, as an athlete myself, I find that in traditional sport, there's always discrimination 
when it comes to female athletes from dress codes and third world countries, I mean, you name it, right? Women have always faced a lot of battles in sport. And this continues, which surprised me in um, esports. So how does the IESF um, plan to actually work around this? Or do you have measures implemented? Uh, it, it's an interesting question. The thing that I, I really enjoy about the whole concept of esports is that you can be anyone of any culture, any gender, any age, and you can compete on the same playing field as somebody else. Um, the girl gamer concept, I think, was a great ideology, and I think that they're doing a fantastic job. We support them. They're a member federation of our organization as well. And I can say that the so solution for me, I think that there is a lot of discrimination happening in esports today because of usernames, because of uh, people being anonymous. Mm -hmm. uh, if we remember, Facebook was the first that made social media personal. It put your real name there. It had you add your real friends and it had your real friends confirm who you are. So all of those funny screen names we had in the past days on Facebook weren't valid because we had to be ourselves. Mm -hmm. Which leads me to believe that uh, this is an important point of the work that we're doing. We have a tolerance commission in the IESF that's discussing how and what tools can be used to ensure, you know, tolerating each other and not discriminating and having an equal playing field. But I truly believe that part of the answer to the solution is to stop being so anonymous and to have responsibility for your comments and for your actions online. Physically, if we put a female swimmer against a male swimmer in the pool, the male swimmer will have a more physical advantage. I believe that the advantage between the genders in esports is a whole lot smaller than the advantage of a pure physical sport. Okay. Thanks for that. So um, here's a second question, and I know that you, you and I discussed it previously, but it comes from one of our listeners. So esports, uh, so we, we discussed this with the Pan American Games earlier last year, and I know that esports was present at the Asian Games, and it was a huge success. Um, and when you and I discussed this regarding Pan Am Games, when I said, Vlad, why isn't um, esports present at Pan Am Games? I appreciated your answer, which said, as until my athletes are treated similar to traditional athletes with the benefits of accommodation and flights being provided, you know, it would be more um, feasible for us to attend and it would make more sense. Now, one of the questions we got here is, can esports work with traditional sport platforms? And are they targeting different audiences or trying to attract fans from traditional sports? So can the current infrastructure be built to sustain both? This is the, this is the most uh, wrong statement I've heard in my life. And I hear it all the time. Esports are taking our athletes. I hate to break it to everyone in the world who's working in sport, but everyone plays games or else the numbers wouldn't be there. I know many, many athlete friends of mine who on the side of doing sports are playing games just as a recreation next to their eight hours of sleep and their food and their training. They have to do something to release a little bit of steam. So I don't see somebody who is physically strong and preparing for a certain type of activity uh, their whole life from the childhood, changing what they do to abandon a sport to go to esports. Rather, I see that people can do both activities. And where we're talking about support models, I truly believe with the IESF, we need to work with every international federation. This is why we are going for the application for GAIF, for the Global Association of International Sport Federations, where all the international federations are members, so that we can have this dialogue and we can have this discussion of how do we get people playing games to try sport and how do we get them healthy and moving mm -hmm. with physical competencies mm -hmm. and sorry with the with the pan american games absolutely esports competing at any type of, of event in the asian games it was a meddling event uh, and it was very successful it can be as well in any other high level event but there has to be uh, i think a level of appreciation and respect that it's not the people who are now arriving from this esport activity who are not part of the family, not part of the community, not with the same benefits, not with the same support or accommodation. It's actually going against the pure principles of sport. 
sport is for inclusivity and sport is for respect. And the first thing you learn when you do sport is how to socialize and be friendly with people. And until, until that can happen where we can understand a model by which people from esports and people from sport, which are today anyway, a lot of the same people can be respected and appreciated on the same way, that will be something that will hold us back. Thank you. Um, Vlad, I think we're close to end, but I'm going to try and sneak in two more questions. So one of them is a sustainability question. A lot of infrastructure is being built for um, sport and um, how much of the infrastructure is continuously used in major cities. Can there be a synergy between e-sport and um, traditional sporting arenas where the venue can be utilized on both sides? Has this happened and can we look to the future with the growing of esports that these venues are used for both? Do you see uh, that? The, the beauty, yes, the beauty of, of esports is that you don't need a sport specific venue. So you can install a massive esports event in any of the traditional sport venues, indoor venues, outdoor venues, maybe not during the day, but in the night to have good glare, as long as you can install the technology in order to be able to have huge screens and spectator seating, and from a technical point of view, run that. The majority of big events around the world who reach a certain size are using traditional sport venues already today, and it's very sustainable. At the same time, that being said, there are being created and built esport centric and specific venues around the world. Um, and that's, that's happening and will continue to happen. I think that definitely that dialogue has to happen. And I think that around the world through our national federations with their national bodies, we need to see how to better implement and use those existing venues that the government has been investing in to utilize them for, for esports, but in projects that promote health. Because the ideology of various ministries of sport at the moment is the, the contrary for many of them because of malinformation or not understanding how the tool can be used. Okay. Great, thanks. Uh, one last question I'm going to get in there, and that is um, there are a lot of companies promoting and organizing esports and esports events, such as Riot Games and um, newly companies like Global Gaming. How, um, and there's also the one in Singapore now. How is ISF dealing with those growing organizations? Uh, there, there, are, there are a lot of publishers on the market and the number of games that are existing are, are huge. Uh, there are some top games around the world that are being played. And for those games, those publishers organize some of their own events. Promoters organize other events. Uh, national federations have national events and we do the world championships for certain titles. I think that as long as we have a clear understanding of what is the objective, what are the benefits of esports and traditional sport, and how can we combine the activity that we have to build a sustainable model in esports, whereby we promote gaming, fun, as well as growth mentally, psychologically, and physically, we need to unite everybody together. And this is something that I've been concentrating on for the past months, and this is something that the ISF is doing. Uh, reaching collaboration points as we have with the Asian Esports Federation, as we have with the WESCO, uh, and as we will continue in the future with bodies, whether it be international federations or whether it be traditional sport or whether it be uh, organizations that have the similar ideology that they want to do something good for humanity. We're going to reach those deals and we can effectuate positive change. Okay, great. Um, so I think we are on time, but uh, if you, I'd like to thank you firstly for your time and I know everybody here appreciate it. Um, if you would like to close on letting us know what, you know, the IESF has a long history and a reputation in the world, um, what is your short term or, or midterm and longer term um, strategy going forward? And with that, I'd like to close off and I'd let you then answer and um, say goodbye to the rest of the listeners. Very good, thank you. So uh, it, it's a good question. During this time, you know, people are telling me congratulations for uh, the position with the ISF. I feel that it's a huge responsibility. And I feel it's a huge responsibility because I'm a person that is coming from traditional sport that understands the value of gaming that also plays games and that knows we need to do something at this moment in time 
to ensure that the youth and the athletes are protected and not to put a, a negative blame or, or, or a, a finger pointing in a negative way. There needs to be a solution that can establish the proper workings between a for-profit company that has a product that they're selling where they want maximum eyeballs on screen time and a non-for-profit organization that is trying to do something which is publicly good. That's trying to ensure that kids are gaming responsibly and that together with all stakeholders and with all of the different organizations around the world, we make that model where we take care of this demographic we promote to them traditional sport. We make them healthy. We make them move. We educate them. We let them have fun, socialize both digitally and physically. And at the end of the day, we can look at ourselves in the mirror and say, hey, it's okay. There has been business. There has been money. Everyone's happy. We don't have uh, serious cases of changing our humanity in the downward shape of having zombies playing on screens. So thank you for your time and looking forward really to unite the whole world of esport in the short term and in the long term to be recognized as a sport and to work closely with all the traditional sport organs, organizations and stakeholders to have this exchange and to motivate a better youth. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad. And thank you all for signing in. So those who um, did not have their questions answered, we will try to get you responses. And um, this um, seminar has been recorded should any of you have missed any of the Q&A or the presentation. So thank you all and yeah, have a good afternoon. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.